Uh, I think the challenge is we have usually much more gradual changes. And then the climate is changing, land is changing, many, many other changes are around as well, you know. And then it's very difficult to, to decompose all this mixture of changes and attribute that that's the reason for this, you know, to, to make this clear causal uh, relationship. That, that's usually very, very difficult. Um, well, the, the system's understanding, is, uh, the system um, functioning should be the same in Africa than in China, of course, but it's more uh, the data is the, the larger challenge and the uh, um, yeah, the, the gradual changes, but also there, you know, in in, uh, in, in southern Africa, uh, like in South Africa, uh, we are involved in, in this uh, reforestation efforts with colleagues from KwaZulu Natal University, and, and there also, you know, they they big plantations of pine trees, you know, or eucalyptus trees all over, you know, quite quite drastic, all the same age, you know, and they all cut at the same time, <laughs> so so um, maybe not at 2,000 kilometer square scale, but at least at that, uh, you know micro scale or a lower meso scale, whatever that is, uh, there you also have some, some drastic changes, and I would expect them in principle the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question concerning the key uh, <coughs> education approach. Uh, I believe everyone would agree in, in general, but um, yeah, this one. Yeah, um, that part you can say, okay, this is uh, geomorphology or hydrology or whatever, climatology or whatever. But what is that? <laughs> what is teached in, in the horizontal thing? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the key is something for geographers which is almost too simple. You know, because you do that, you just, geography is a, is a discipline where you try to integrate. But I'm at TU Delft, I'm in the, in the civil engineering department, I'm professor, you know, the really hardcore civil engineers. Yeah? For them, I would argue, uh, the, the, the horizontal bar of the T is an understanding of ecology, understanding of hydrology, uh, for hydrology engineers, I mean, understanding of uh, basic knowledge of uh, governance, water governance, if they, if they focus on water. But it's the, the, this kind of understanding of, of neighboring disciplines, basic understanding, of course not everybody can be an expert there, but at least a basic understanding of these other disciplines, and also then professional and functional competencies. Like professional competencies, uh, being able to synthesize things, being, being analytic in, in the way you, you, you study time series, but, but even being also able to synthesize uh, different findings, being able to write reports, being able to give a presentation in time to the point, uh, these type of professional skills. And so I, I argue it's also part of the, the horizontal bar. And we try to, to bring that in our curriculum, that, that the students Besides that, we teach them hydrology, we, we also expose them to other problems, and through the examination, for instance, we try to stimulate the development of the, the horizontal bar as well. Yeah. But it, maybe for geography, I, I don't know, but, but, but um, I'm also coming from that background in, in Prague, because I started with physical geography there. To understand the neighboring discipline was, 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 a, was a very natural thing you have to do anyway. Yeah? But it's not the same. If you, if you really go to, to somebody who's really focusing on uh, Geobotany or uh, hydraulic structures or, or whatever, then um, that's different. Yeah. Are you trying to introduce not only natural science or engineering science, but also human science? Yeah, yeah when I say governance, I mean in particular social sciences, yeah, like uh, um, some economics, sociology. But uh, taught by by a natural uh, scientist or oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, at, at IHE well, we are in a very fortunate position that we have people from all these different disciplines so we have people from law and administration background and, and okay. uh, yeah, business schools and management and, and all this they, they come from that background they are social scientists they research in social science they all work on water problems so in uh, in, in projects, we, we can recruit people from the same institute and then work together and then also try to work on this uh, horizontal bar. Uh, in, the, in the education, yes, also there. Uh, it's not that I start teaching about governance, you know, that, that, that's not necessarily the best to be at. But yeah, people from, from law or the administration background who, who do that. But they're a little bit bored, you know, because then sometimes it's very basic for them. And they're, they're not, not too interested to, to teach always the basics. Like, like if you would ask Professor Dico, he always explain the water balance to everybody and the whole faculty, which I think would be very good if everybody really could understand the water balance. But that's, that's, that's very repetitive for the lecturer. So that's a bit of a challenge. 
But uh, in Holland, we also have the system that uh, also um, not only professors can lecture, also they, uh, um, uh, yeah, we have lecturers, senior lecturers, associate professors, we have these, these different levels and they all lecture. And, yeah, then also social scientists are teaching social science to engineers. Yeah. Okay. It's an interesting approach. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, bye bye. Yeah, John. Yeah, thanks a lot for the presentation. Oh, I have two questions. One is related also to this theme. So I'm also trying to figure out what the practical implications of the horizontal bar are. So are these the courses to, are these different courses? Or is it like the introductionary course on social, on governance aspects for engineers? Is that, are the governance students also sitting there? Or is really tailored courses which are more providing overview knowledge for people from other disciplines? That's the first question. And the second question is on the, you were joking about the IWM programs which are producing this uh, generalist. So my question is on IWM and all the criticism on IWM maybe having failed as a holistic concept and, and, and all this debate. So I would be interested in your views on that. Uh, your first question, we have a very strict modular system, so all of our education is, is kind of bro broken down into pieces of three weeks, not three weeks modul modules, and then there's one module on, on uh, integrated water resource management, but then also some economics or project uh, planning or something comes in, and uh, that's then for a hydrologist, the horizontal part, but this is a specialized course. But the water management students, they don't sit in that lecture, because that's too basic for them, and also at at the time that this is taught is maybe not, 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 not the same course because the, the water management students need this basic understanding already in, in early part of the curriculum, so in October, they start for us in October for instance, and they, they need this in earlier part of their, their study, while the, the hydraulic engineers and the hydrologists, they only get that in module 10 and that's maybe June, July, that would be far too late. So from scheduling wise and from a didactical approach, they are different courses and they are taught in different parts because it's not useful to, to mix them all together. However, we do have, and now, now how do we do that? Yeah? We, we, have, we, we are a small water university. The whole country is studying water. Um, so from the week one, from the first day they enter, we put them, for instance, in a, in a general introductionary week on water and sustainable development. And then they have to work immediately cross-disciplinary. So they have to, uh, for one week. And then they have to, in a team, uh, do something, uh, uh, get, get, a, get a problem, and as a team have to uh, prepare a small presentation and, and write a small expose and uh, are exposed from, from day one working with people coming from hydraulic engineering or from economics background or from, from what, whatever background. So they get that <coughs> from the beginning. We also, from the first day, we expose them to different didactical approaches, lectures, but also teamwork, uh, um, assignments where they have to, to work on problems. Uh, yeah, the different ways. Also the way we examine their knowledge, written exams, but also presentations, uh, expose writing, and all these different things. It all helps to, to, to work on that horizontal bar. Uh, your, your second question, <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a supporter of IWM approach in general. So when I was joking, I was saying, well, people always, some people say, oh, we look at the whole river basin, we are so, that's the integrated approach. Now, when I was explaining about the moisture fluxes from the Congo basin to Ethiopia, then I was saying, well, you also not only study the Nile if you do integrated water basin, you have to look at all uh, uh, moisture fluxes on the African continent there, you know, <laughs> to see how, how actually it, the, 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 uh, it, it does not start where the rain starts to fall, it starts where the rain comes from. Yeah? Or the Chinese integrated water resources doesn't, doesn't stop at the Chinese border, even if the river basins are within China. No, you have to look at what the land use policies are in, in Europe and, and the rest of Asia. So, so that's what I mean. Uh, integrated water resources, you have to integrate out of your catchment, integrated river basin model, uh, integrated river basin management is another uh, uh, common uh, buzzword or a kind of light word. Yeah? But I think it's not only the river basin, it's kind of studying the whole system. And that could be well outside the basin. Also the policies in India, uh, even if they imply only on, on the Indian basin, you know, they, they have huge impacts on, on Bangladesh and, and then also on Nepal and the backward approach. And that's what I mean. But I'm not, not against integrated water resource management. I very much think that uh, also generalists can, can find, uh, not all focus actually on journalists, but many of the programs I'm, I'm aware of in Africa, uh, they, they are very um, yeah, focusing on journalists. And they, they have their role to play and they can be very efficient. But also you see that 
in, uh, in projects, people with real technical knowledge who can design a bridge are also missing. So not only producing always generalists in, in the field of water, you also need hardcore people who really uh, are um, like a specialist in water discipline. Therefore, we opted as a basically a bit engineering-dominated school in Delft. We, so we are not really equal with other scientists. It's more engineering than the other disciplines. Uh, we, we feel um, this, this T-shape is the right thing for us. But I'm not, not against IWM or anything. But after in the evening, if you lecture the whole, and people are tired, and you have to make up them, so it's a joke to check if people are still listening. <laughs> but it's very difficult to, yeah. to make management on the whole world. So mm. uh, <laughs> China is uh, yeah. the increase in the meat uh, use um, in China causes uh, impact in, in the Amazon area. Mm -hmm. Because Zoya are important, all mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. So management in China would be management in Amazon. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a bit difficult. Yeah, okay. I, I agree that the Chinese uh, graduates can, cannot influence directly, but it, but it starts with awareness. Huh? Well, it starts with understanding these processes. That's what we have to bring in as scientists, and then and, and raising the awareness of the students. They they need to know what what the meat consumption in China, how that impacts uh, rainforest in, in in other continents. They they need first need to understand and, and to have that awareness. Yeah. You know? And then they can maybe also end up with better policies in their own country. But so, so for us, you know, we are researchers and, and, and educators. So, so it starts with just understanding the system and making others aware. And uh, then they are responsible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Just <laughs> thinking is most important. Yeah. yeah. How about the next question? Uh, sorry, Another question. I was curious since most of your master and PhD students are from developing countries. I was wondering, and, and very often maybe the education system in the developing countries is a little bit behind what the latest might be. In this, uh, but, uh, like in Europe, so is there a problem for those people going back actually to to do what they have, to actually implement what they have learned? Because maybe let's take agriculture sector they had learned the latest with water and agriculture and then they come into extension systems or, or even in an education system or in the implementation system which doesn't support what they have actually learned. Are you mm. facing that problem? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, all the time of course. It starts when they come. They, uh, sorry, uh, students are similar as this. some students, students in Bonn, I think it's the same, I guess, or itself, uh, set. Um, they come from very educational, different education systems with different backgrounds, also different cultures, yeah. uh, uh, different ethnic groups, different uh, religious groups, and so on. And then, then it's, a, it's a big challenge to, to teach to very heterogeneous classes. So we have that, that we have very much. Uh, it helps in the, in the educational approach to, to mix all students, uh, uh, getting people out of the comfort zone. So in some education system, it's still the case that they are not used to present in front of an audience or, or to oppose professors. Huh? In some countries, it's very easy. Professors are always right. But, but in other countries, you know, then you, you want to have a scientific debate. Yeah? So, so, so that, that sometimes I make mistakes or say something wrong, so, but that, that I just give in and say it immediately. You know? But that's for some, in, in some cultural settings, this is impossible. Yeah? Uh, they're, they're Professor is always right, yeah. and uh, th that's another cultural thing of what, what we have to work on. Uh, then, then they return, as, as you said, and, then, and maybe uh, the knowledge is not applicable. But um, hmm. I, I think our target market for graduates is the developing countries. Therefore, we teach also partly different subjects than, than you would find in Wageningen or at uh, TU Delft or uh, I don't know about Bonn University. So we kind of uh, they, we also partners, guest lectures, we do a lot of joint programs with southern universities, so it's demand driven and also um, local solutions are, are, are explained in case studies and so it's not only western high-tech solution necessarily the best, huh? yeah. of course, that, that's, that's trivial. Um, that not all knowledge is applicable later, I, yeah, yeah, that's true, but uh, would you therefore deny knowledge? Oh, you didn't suggest that, but <laughs> would, you, would you deny somebody the latest knowledge? No, no, is that, an, is that a possibility to leapfrog? About, about other knowledge. Yeah. So many many places in Africa, the the, uh, the telephone landlines will never be come in because the, it's it's kind of immediately go for cell phone networks. So, so of course, yeah. so, so the latest knowledge always should be applied and should be helpful. Yeah. 
Also, I, I, um, I don't like it. Again, he didn't suggest that, but colleagues said, yeah, you know, this complicated hydrogens, all this kind of physical based modeling or whatever, you know, that, that's that we don't need for Africa. But that's nonsense, you know, of course, <laughs> of course you need the same knowledge, the same complexity for, for Africa, wherever you work, you know. But, um, uh, so always the nature's knowledge, not, not the simple, quick and dirty methods are, are good in the development context. You know? Maybe the data is not there, okay, then we have to work with other models, but we, I, I strongly believe we should, we should take the, the state of the science yeah? and should, should uh, present the state of the science in the classroom. Yeah? Yeah? I completely agree. Um, I think we are you going to uh, try, uh, try to improve the uh, education system in the countries where these students are coming from. So actually you are collecting people from around the world to Delft, and, but uh, one can also do the other way around, uh, improve teaching capabilities and yeah. performance in other countries. Uh, is that also a concept yeah. from the UNESCO? Yeah, yeah, very much. And uh, we, that's also our mandate, to, to strengthen uh, universities. We do that in projects where we uh, um, help with curriculum development, help with uh, infrastructure development, like the classrooms and uh, research site facilities and, and all this. We do a lot of projects. We also train our trainers a lot. So many of our PhD students work at universities in their home countries. So they do a PhD with us and then return as lecturer to their home country and then uh, uh, yeah, work with us in long term. We do a lot of these joint programs nowadays. I think we have 24 specializations in total. Oh, we have four master programs and then within these programs there's many different tracks and specializations. It takes too long to go into details, but many are together as with partners in Ethiopia, in, uh, in uh, AIT Bangkok we do something, and uh, we're busy in Vietnam at the moment, and in other places where we try to strengthen universities to, to collaboration. Yeah. We also, we, uh, so I am very open with that as well, we earn money with that. Um, our uh, turnover is 30 million from the institute. And about one third we get from the Dutch government as, as a base subsidy, and two thirds we earn. And we have to constantly earn money uh, through our uh, academic work. So we do that EU projects and uh, Dutch <coughs> projects. And so far, non German money so far, so didn't succeed in that. But, uh, but we, we do this capacity building development uh, projects as well. So, so through strengthening the universities in Rwanda and, and so on, we, we, we also, yeah, these are paid projects. So why, why, why doing that? We are paid and keep the keep the uh, the system ongoing. So to some extent, we are kind of uh, academic entrepreneurs also, where, where we work um, in we, we are not there to make profits. We are not even allowed to make profit, but but we are there to, to pay the salaries of the people. So, so through under entrepreneurial projects, we we uh, uh, we keep the, the system uh, ongoing. And these capacity building projects usually are very essential for our to to close the to close the bills um, <laughs> at the end of the year. Yeah. So we do that a lot, and it's very important for us. A short story. Two years ago, I was in uh, Sao Carlos in uh, Brazil, and I was on a ex sport excursion with Mario, a guy from Sao Carlos, and uh, he got a telephone call, and two minutes later he asked me, would you like to talk to Stefan? <laughs> <laughs> he was calling from Delft to Sao Carlos, yeah. and then we talked about <laughs> telephone two years ago. So, yeah. so, yeah. Two, have you talked about bomb water recharge in that area near South Carlos? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Hydrologist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, can we come back with the climate change research a bit? Um, okay, I'm not really in the research of climate change, so maybe what I'm saying is a bit irrelevant. So what, uh, what uh, I get from the presentation is complexity of the how to evaluate the impact, whether it's from climate change or maybe other other factors for them to develop. Uh, chain. So how do you see now with the project and research in developing country, mostly when they say climate change adaptation, so they base on the climate change uh, research and knowledge by a scenario and then they evaluate something and try to figure out the adaptation strategies. And it's becoming really common, for example, in Mekong Delta and Vietnam, really common people just based on that and trying to figure out something through the research. So, whether it's the for, the for the moment, whether it's a good way to go, or whether we should pay more attention on to figure out the uncertainty first. Uh, uh, it's a very complex question, and I'm, I'm not sure if I have the answer to that. Um, a lot of research is needed. 
but research is not necessarily reducing the uncertainty. Uh, that, that's a provocative statement to people that are crazy or scientists, what are you saying here? No. I, I, I even think that if you look at the early uh, IPCC reports, the, uh, the uncertainty of the climate change, or the temperature predictions of the future, climate change is much more than temperature, but usually it goes to how much warmer does it get in the next 100 years. The uncertainty ranges were smaller than in the last report. After, I don't know, I don't know thousands of PhD students doing all sorts of research related to that field. So it's not that better understanding necessarily reduce the uncertainties. So the, to understand, so the, why do I say that? To, to understand the impact for climate change on the Mekong Delta, not necessarily having better system understanding is reducing. That you, then you say, but in four, five years, then I finish my PhD, then I know. No, it's not like this. You, know? you, you rather understand the system better, you see the complexity of it, you see how many different variables act and um, uh, contribute to, to the overall impact of climate change in the Mekong Delta that, you, that the uncertainty even get larger because you realize how much more complex it is than, you, than, you, than it was when you started four years ago with your PhD. So, um, so more, more research to first reduce the uncertainty and then we act, I think is nonsense. Sorry for this, but, but I really feel uh, we, we scientists, we oversell ourselves if we, if we keep on promising, uh, uh, then we know. And it's also maybe not, not necessarily our job as scientists to, to of course, we, we should work in exact knowledge and we should produce reproducible results and all that, of course. But it's not that we uh, just then have one answer and then, then we do it. Uh, and certainly with climate change, with such a chaotic and, and complex system, you know, that uh, a couple of more years research will not reduce the uncertainty. I, I dare to make that, that statement. Yeah. Therefore, instead of kind of waiting till, till the point when you know, it's maybe too late, so therefore to, uh, what is the policy at the moment is to, to do so-called so no-regret strategies, something which are good anything, you know. So for, for make, uh, it could be uh, structural measures in the Mekong Delta to, to, to uh, manage uh, seawater intrusion or, or whatever you, you want to deal with, and it could be, but it could also be uh, so, uh, soft measures. Insurance systems, uh, I don't know, better land, land use planning, agricultural alternatives, aquaculture alternatives for the people living there, all sorts of other things that, that are maybe offering more opportunities for the, for the people in the region anyway. And I think that the best investment you can do is education and capacity building because then you, you give people, you educate people and if, if you have more educated people, uh, it's always good. If climate change at the end is maybe not that tough as we expect, it doesn't matter because they contribute to development. They can do many things if they are well educated. They're not only uh, we, we don't train people only to, to deal with climate change. Now, that's nonsense. Of course, we, we train good physical geographers or hydrologists or, or whatever we want to train, and, and they, they can be very useful anyway. So I think that the best no-regret investment a country could do is uh, strengthening the education. Yeah. And then, then, then the solutions come in. Then, then you can do structural, non-structural measures and uh, whatever. I hope I answered partly. <laughs> my, my, thank you. Thank you very much for the nicely structured uh, presentation. It's very good. Uh, I want to point out about this uh, systems thinking stuff. And uh, clearly, the T-shaped thing would uh, might address the systems thinking at the individual level. But uh, what about the larger levels? How can we implement systems thinking at larger levels, especially at which level? Larger level, larger. whatever larger level. I mean, you know, okay, five people working together and you can do some systems thing and you have to show something. But you just have said that you increase the uh, unpredictability, the uncertainty increases when many more people start to think together about the same thing. You know, it's obviously will increase the uncertainty if many more people start to work on something with different perspectives. So we will have more variance. To, 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 to do precise assertions about something. Of course, you just counter respond with yourself and saying that, okay, if you have qualified people at the, the hard spectrum, you will solve whatever small problem that arises. Is there, is there a contradiction? Okay, that's not important, but you tell me, please, how do you implement OKU? What would you think to implement systems thinking at larger scale than just one person thinking in this T-shaped way? Mm -hmm. Ah, difficult. <laughs> I, I, I feel yeah, that if you have more people educated in that way and, and, and supporting that, that sort of thinking, that this should 
be applicable at all levels, you know, if you do large scale policies or if you are uh, working at the municipality of whatever city <laughs> or, uh, or your farm. So I, I, I don't think it's, there's a principal problem if, on, of the scale. That, that with this idea is that I cannot change the world, I agree, yes. <laughs> But I'm naive enough to continuously uh, kind of <laughs> use that and, and, and try to trigger that with the students and, and kind of enter that discussion and, and provoke this thinking. That's, that, at the end, I hope, contributes then to, to better development also at larger scales. So, uh, I'm not sure if I satisfied that. <laughs> Another question somewhere? Yeah, it was more a comment on the, on the problem <coughs> that was raised in, in the Mekong lab. It's like what many of us will expect when, when we got educated and when we are then put in a situation returning to somewhere or, or meeting some people, um, we have this, this, yeah, this game we're in, that we are the scientists and then we have people that are like working on practical solutions and then they come and address, they, they want to have a plan, they want to have a statement like what do I have to do? And as you said, like yes, you have to educate the people that you can then have uh, deal with the no regret solutions and work on that. But it's exactly often um, the problem that we have to deal with that we have to be aware. Yes, we live with uncertainties, and often we cannot um, come with the only solution or to make. We can sometimes we cannot develop simple a plan for the next five years and say, oh, this is what we have to do. Um, this. This is the, the, the complex situation we are in, and I think these are many of the pitfalls that we have to deal with. That we, yeah, we learn more, we learn more about the uncertainties, and we learn, well, sometimes we just cannot come up with a plan for, for and with one simple solution, but we can only make recommendations, or you can develop ideas on it, but it's often not that easy to say, this is the way to go. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some more comments, questions? Yeah. This is a question. Uh, uh, as we discussed about these uncertainties and complex systems, so you know, it's like this can just want to know your, maybe your personal or your institutional opinions on, you know, to, to what extent you, you use modeling. Because like, in this world, of, you know, in this, Effort, let's say, to to strengthen the nexus between uh, research and policies, so to let's say, and you know, a lot of now modeling is becoming kind of the buzzwords of of, of of research. And then, to what extent you you would you would use it or you, you use it? And yeah, uh, of course, we use models huh? in ideology. That's that's a very dominated. I, I feel sometimes too much, but. <laughs> But uh, yeah, yeah, of course we use models, we use models to, to simulate um, our system's understanding. We use models to predict how the system would react under different circumstances if we change the land, if we change the climate or whatever. Huh? So how, how would that uh, respond to it? Huh? It also is very helpful to do modeling to just synthesize your data because you know, sometimes you, you but just simple, but I showed from the challenge example, it's just a sometimes series analysis and statistical methods that were developed uh, Years ago, nothing, nothing really innovative in there. The innovative part is only that we collect the data and, and try to understand what the data tells us. But from a modeling point of view, there was nothing, nothing, nothing fancy in there. But, but if you have many different data sets to bring them together, models can help you to, to synthesize them and put them in context. And that's going beyond the normal thinking, what we could see on, on correlation analysis or some simple time series analysis. Therefore, models are super important and then we use them. Challenges to, to for us hydrologists, we, 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 re, we recognize how difficult it is with other scientists and they, they work also completely different models and make these models talking to each other and, and kind of producing something useful at the end is, is very, very challenging. But Professor Dick, I'm sure, can expand on that from his global, global uh, um, experiences huh? uh, and others in the audience maybe as well. But it, it, it is a big challenge to, to make these uh, communicating. We have one group in, called Hydroinformatics. Uh, they, they work on the you know, between hydrology modeling and informatics, and uh, they really focus on, on that field, on uh, coupling models, um, providing decision support through integrating modeling, and, uh, and, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we use them, it's an important part of our education. Yeah. Some people also said it's a 
it's a nice indoor sport and has little to do with reality. But <laughs> I believe in, in that was are very useful, but, but I, I don't think that they are the answer to everything. Maybe you can really explain that much better from your experience from global. <laughs> Thank you very much for your nice presentation. And I wanted to know about the use of remote sensing in deriving the hydrological parameters. As we know that remote sensing is a very powerful tool nowadays, and we can derive all those hydrological parameters like rainfall from GRN data and Jebal from Jebal, we get the evapor transportation. So what is the work going on in the institute in this direction? Is there any work going on? Yeah, yeah, but we are more on the user side of remote sensing data, so we, we analyze remote sensing data and, and, and make that, you know, bring that then into parameterized hydrologic models. The one one which came recently got in, in climatic change was the, the change the use of MODIS data, analyzed snow and ice cover distribution of the Himalaya, and then uh, uh, looked at, at patterns of changes in snow and ice cover based on MODIS data, so we're analyzing data, trying to understand how these different patterns, are there significant changes, what does that mean, and then feed that into hydrological models, and what does that mean for water resources in, in the region. Huh? So that, that, that was one example where we used remote sensing data. Or for our land use classification from the past, we do the same as, as many groups worldwide, that we try to uh, interpret um, yeah, land use changes over time, and uh, what does that mean for, for hydrological parameters in that place mainly for parameterizing hydrologic models. Yeah. I'm personally not the, the expert there, I really need to say, but I have some colleagues who, uh, who know more about that, so I benefit, uh, benefit from them. <laughs> but we can derive all those hydrological parameters from remote sensing, and if no. there is no, yeah, like uh, start from start, uh, soil moisture, and then you got the transpiration from the world. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and and the from question from is at which scale and what exactly? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> if you look for soil moisture, for example, which sensor are you using? SMOS, which has a depth of yeah. 5 to 10 centimeters, how important is that? Yeah. You can use GRACE in a scale of 500 by 500 kilometers, very nice. A bit <laughs> large, but yeah. and so far. So, that's not the solution. That's one of many aspects one has to consider, and uh, especially land use is most important to get information on for from satellites, yeah. but uh, there is no one solution in that sense, neither for hydrology nor for, for erosion or whatever. I'm interested in. The most important is the ground truth also. Huh? The, the, my view is a reflection of a wavelength what we're looking at. Huh? It's not a hydrological parameter that these maps, independent how colorful they are. Huh? <laughs> it's a reflection of a wavelength, I tell my students. So <laughs> but if you don't have any data, like yeah, yeah. nothing, and then yeah. you can go for it. I agree, and it's very, very useful, and we all agree, I guess. Yeah. So my question is related with irrigated lands. In the world, millions of hectares of lands are irrigated, and now there's a problem of the salinity. So it's salinity, and the planners are now implementing for the two expect for infrastructure development by irrigation, and one is the uh, bar dryness. And you show some picture. If we planted some highly transpiring trees, that will be some result may be the another. So for the sustainable sustainable management of such irrigated land, what would you suggest? By drainage or it is any infrastructure development? Well, I, I don't feel competent to really answer that question. I think it needs much more local understanding of the situation, you know. Mm -hmm. Why is the salinity there? To, to which extent? Uh, what irrigation practices are there? What are the option, technical options? Uh, to, to I don't think that I would uh, I would uh, that would be fair to just you know give one answer, one sentence to that. Uh, I uh, I don't feel that I can do that because we need a better understanding of what really causes salinity, to what extent, and you know what are the circumstances, what is the climate there, you know what what plants are used. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot cannot answer the question. I guess. Thank you. Okay. Last class. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again, Stefan, for coming and your nice presentation. Thank you uh, very much for coming and listening and discussing. And I think that was a very nice event today. Thank you very much. <laughs>